um, because actually internationally they're not you know, focused on New Balance. But they are focused on an awful lot of issues that um, we here at Maine care about. And I thought I would talk about some of those. And they happen to be some things that the Trade Commission has um, decided to take a deeper look at. So it's, it's kind of a, just a detour just a bit about the Trade Commission. That was set up um, over um, 10 years ago uh, to basically look at what is the impact of trade policy on the state of Maine, positive and negative. You know, how, how does it affect us? Um, and it's complicated stuff, as you probably now really know. And those of us who were on it, it took, it's take, took me years to really start to try to understand this stuff. So it's very complicated on one level, but on other level, it's pretty simple. And that's the approach I'm going to try to get into now. Um, there's already been some talk about farms and, and food. And the, the Trade Commission is required to come up with a report every two years um, to look at the impact of trade on the state. And because it's so huge, we've decided uh, over the last few years to just focus on one or two issues and really delve deeply into those issues. So as was mentioned, we did look at food this year. And one of the concerns with the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that uh, it's literally going to flood the marketplace with extremely cheap um, dairy products, particularly from New Zealand, and that one of the consequences of that is going to be to drive down dairy prices here in Maine. And of course, we have a real success story in um, you know turning around farming in this state. We have a long way to go, but we're one of the you know few places where we're actually uh, increasing production, um, land and production. The age of farmers is going down a little bit, so that we have younger farmers starting up. And we have a dairy industry that's been stabilized over the years through a, um, a program that helps even out the, the prices. And that is something that also could be targeted as, as a, um, a discriminatory uh, subsidy, potentially. So it, we looked at that and decided that's a real concern. Um, just to stick on food, something we haven't talked about, seafood, also with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I actually read a um, mystery novel, <laughs> and the subject of it was seafood fraud. <laughs> and I believe this novel was completely accurate, actually, in terms of describing what goes on in these international seafood markets and, and basically, you know, really bad stuff being passed off as good stuff. And one of the things about um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that we are going to be uh, entering into an agreement with all of these Pacific nations, some of which, like Vietnam and uh, some of the other countries, do not have strong health and safety regulations, so do not have strong um, fishing rules. And of course, Maine lives and dies uh, economically you know, uh, in the marine area by the quality of our seafood. And that's also important. So it's important to us that we have really high quality standards. And that phytosanitary thing that Ron was talking about, that's, uh, it's taken me a while to figure out what the heck that is too. But basically it's food um, standards, food safety standards is what it is. And so the goal of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also the Transatlantic is to um, essentially have one standard that applies everywhere. So we were just hearing moments ago about food sovereignty and different local um, rules. Well, the goal is to get rid of local rules and to get rid of state rules and to really just have one rule. And not only that, but to sort of limit the number of inspections that you could require and say, well, if we have this free trade agreement with country X over here and country X agrees that they will have a good food safety system, then we don't need to require inspections when that food comes over to the US because we have this big trade agreement and so everything will be fine. And that's not really the way it works. I mean, even right now, when we don't have the trade agreement, we have bad food coming over um, our borders, both from within the country and from without. So that is a very serious um, concern. And it is one both in terms of um, taking over local control, but also just you know, food safety. Are we going to be eating bad food? And can we brand this food as, as main high quality food or, or not? And even now, without these new agreements under the WTO, um, the um, US has adopted um, country of origin labeling that was applied to beef. And that has been ruled to be a discriminatory policy and invalid under the WTO rules. So if we want to be able to um, label food in a way, whether where it's from, or also 
label it about things like GMO um, contents and, and things like that, that is another policy that is very much um, threatened by these um, trade agreements. And in fact, if you go to um, public hearings that the U.S. government has, the trade um, representative has, and also they have these stakeholder meetings where stakeholders, which I'm a stakeholder, but so is like the Crop Life International. Um, if you go to one of these, Crop Life International will tell you exactly what it intends to achieve in the transatlantic uh, or the TTIP agreement, and that is to get rid of all those pesky GMO labeling laws around the country. They, they say it straight out, and they put it in writing, so it's, it's great to go and collect up their testimony. Um, so that's a, a big concern. Um, also, um, one of the, another issue that the commission has looked at is um, healthcare issues, and particularly prescription drug prices. And in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we know that our own U.S. government is pushing very hard to get rules around drugs that will keep prices high, in fact, make them go higher, um, by delaying the opportunity to get generic drugs as long as possible. And when something, before something becomes generic, a company has a monopoly on it, and they can charge as much as they want. Okay, and that's the situation we're in right now with some of these hepatitis drugs and some of the other uh, major, um, you know, um, life-saving drugs are unbelievably expensive. And so these agreements are designed to put rules in place to make things trade easier for the pharmaceutical companies. And what does that mean? It means for them being able to charge as much as they want. They're also trying to get rules that will make it difficult, if not impossible, to negotiate drug prices. And you probably know this, but the United States is like the only country out there that doesn't do this, okay? <laughs> Except in Medicaid. And we will never do it if these trade agreements go through because they will write rules in. And so when they say, oh, don't worry about it, we're not going to mess up anything that's happening now. Well, okay, but we don't do anything now, okay? <laughs> it's, but what will it do for the future? And so that is very much a goal. Um, tobacco regulation, something that the Trade Commission looked at, um, there, um, Cynthia mentioned these um, investor state cases. There's cases going on right now challenging other countries, Uruguay, Australia, for putting into place um, labeling rules on their cigarette packaging um, because this hurts the profits of the companies and it, their, quote, intellectual property because the, the you know, the the Marlboro Man is shrunk to a very tiny, or it isn't even there anymore, so therefore their profits are hurt. And so they're going to these international arbitration panels um, to try to get um, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, and to prevent any of these rules from going into effect. So, you know, that's kind of a laundry list of some of the things. I think what it comes down to is, is really it's an assault on democracy. And I'm just going to give you two final things. I mentioned the ISDS, and interestingly enough, even the Cato Institute, which is extremely conservative and, and, and pro-trade in general, thinks that the ISDS clause, which is the Investor State Dispute Settlement Clause, should just be taken out. Now, they think partly it should be taken out because that way maybe the trade agreement will pass, and you know, so they think that will make it politically better. But they also think it should be taken out because it's completely unnecessary. We have courts. They do a fine job of determining these things, and we don't need to have private tribunals where they're secret and a bunch of trade lawyers who make a lot of money um, participating in them. Uh, you know, it's a self-perpetuating system. The other thing that's come out more recently, um, uh, Cynthia mentioned this uh, regulatory harmonization. Well, there's even as bad as that, they're proposing this thing in the European agreement, which is called a Regulatory Cooperation Council. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> we, we all want to cooperate, don't we? But <laughs> what this is is actually like this sort of super council of um, bureaucrats that would be um, international. So they'd represent both the U United States and the EU. And they would oversee regulations and um, laws um, that we're trying to pass. So they would review and have an, a formal role reviewing legislation that legislators in the state of Maine wanted to pass on any subject and make you do a trade impact analysis, a regulatory impact analysis, and also defend why you pass that policy instead of some other policy that might be cheaper 
for businesses to comply with. Now you know the result of this. The result of this is why we currently don't regulate any chemicals in the, in the country practically in consumer products. And that is the goal, is to create a, a you know, they say it's paralysis by analysis, but it's also, as I said, a democracy issue because it's basically, you know, taking away the right to pass your, your laws and to, to decide what it is that, you know, to, to be, uh, to govern yourself and give it to this unelected body that is beholden to um, these international corporations. And so it's, it's really quite appalling. And so I think it is absolutely critical um, that we get as involved as, in fact, they are in Europe. Um, I, I have been to three different um, times. I've been to Europe now, to Brussels and to Strasbourg, to meet with members of parliament who are very interested in what we're doing here in Maine around food and other things, and to hear from people in other countries what they're doing. And you talked about uh, having local uh, uh, TPP-free zones. Um, they're passing TTIP-free zones uh, all over Europe, in France, in, in um, Spain. Um, they're very motivated. They're working hard on it, and they are particularly focused on the investor state provisions and some of these regulatory cooperation because they see that as just, you know, it goes over all of the issues. And it's really, again, they care about democracy too. So I think there's a lot of energy around that, but again, uh, fast track is critically important to stop because, you know, if you negotiate something in secret and then you have a speeded up process to um, decide whether or not to uh, finalize it, then it essentially gets voted on without anyone knowing what's in it. And that, if you want to talk about, you know, undermining democracy, that's how you do it. So, go to town. <laughs>